having a working mic like this is like very intense. Um, welcome everyone. I'm so glad to see all of you here tonight. Um, welcome to St. Francis College. Uh, this is our actually our inaugural Write in Brooklyn event. Um, so you're here, so give it up for Write in Brooklyn. It's sort of an umbrella term that um, was a catchphrase kind of from our, our MFA program that we launched a couple of years ago. Um, and we're going to be featuring lots of great writers um, that write in Brooklyn or around Brooklyn or write, and they just kind of like Brooklyn, I don't know. It's, <laughs> you're in Brooklyn and it's writing, I feel like that's, that's the information. Um, I'm Theo Ganji, I'm the director of the MFA program here at uh, St. Francis. Um, and I'm very excited to be here, I'm just going to say a couple of words about the program. Um, we are, we're just two years old. Uh, we'll be graduating our first class in July, which is exciting. <laughs> Guys, Cloud, I didn't even tell you too, that was amazing. Um, and we, uh, we've got some great literary program going on in general. We have um, our featured faculty for fiction is uh, the novelist Marlon James, Booker winner, um, author of uh, Brief History of Seven Killings, and um, what is it, Red Leopard? What was, what was the colors of the wolf? Black, 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 wolf. black Wolf, Red Leopard, Black Wolf, which is uh, absolutely brilliant. We also have um, the story writer Jamel Brinkley, who was a finalist for a National Book Award. Um, in poetry, we, uh, we have um, the poet Mahogany Brown and our own Felice Bell in the audience. Give it up for Felice. And for screenwriting, I'm very happy to introduce our new dramatic writing coordinator, uh, Mr. Ben Snyder. Um, Ben is an accomplished playwright. Uh, his featured directorial debut, 1115, with Julia Stiles and John Leguizamo. <laughs> Spoiling me, I'm gonna stop every time. Um, streaming on Showtime, uh, his original pilot, TV pilot, Nobody's Nobody, is in development with Water Brothers Digital. He was the story consultant for the award-winning documentary, The Wolf Pack. His plays have been produced at PS122, The Vineyard Theater, Crossroads Theater, Apollo Theater, New York Stage and Film, and HBO's U.S. Comedy Arts Festival. Uh, so I'm going to have Ben come up here and tell you more about the amazing event with Dominique. We have um, so give it up nice and loud for Ben Snyder. Good evening. <laughs> it is loud. Um, my name is Ben Snyder. I'm the coordinator of the uh, dramatic writing side of our uh, low residency MFA writing program. Who in here is part of the MFA writing program? Are our students here? Some of them. Okay, cool. Um, if you'd like to learn more, please visit the website. It is my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce Dominique Mariso to all of you, um, though many of you Oh, that's, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Man, I'm used to, many of you already know her. Um, I have a uh, particular history with Dominique um, that spans uh, almost 20 years. Uh, at one time, Dominique was my student. At one time, she was my mother. At one time, she was my ex-girlfriend. At one time, she was my basketball coach. Um, for many years, uh, Dominique and I toured New York City performing uh, in public and alternative high schools. We've been everything two people can be to each other um, performing. Uh, and that's when I first met her at the uh, Educational Theater Company Creative Arts Team. Um, since then, I have been so uh, honored and privileged to watch her uh, star ascend um, and all of her great things happen. A long time ago, uh, Dominique would tell her friends, I want you to get famous so when you come to my wedding, you'll be famous at my wedding. Well, Dominique was the most famous person at my wedding. Um, 
I'm gonna get into her bio from a program from her show. Um, who, who has seen this yet? I saw it. I'm gonna say this is the greatest jukebox musical of all time. Um, I'll just put it out there. Um, please see it if you haven't yet. If you like The Temptations, you will love this. If you don't like The Temptations, leave. Um, you don't know good music. So I'm gonna, I don't, I haven't memorized all of her many, many accolades. Um, so I'm gonna read them to you. Uh, she wrote The Detroit Project. If, if you know the project, just make noise. The Detroit Project, uh, which includes Skeleton Crew, Paradise Blue, Detroit 67, Pipeline, Sunset Baby, Blood at the Root, Follow Me to Nelly's, Ain't Too Proud. That's a lot. Um, She's won many, 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 many awards. She's a genius, certified genius, Arthur Genius Award winner. She wrote for Shameless. She does everything. Um, but before I bring her out, um, anyone not familiar with her work? Um, okay, great. You're about to be familiarized with her work. If I were making like a playlist of my Dominique Mariso greatest hits. Um, one that I would definitely include is Giselle the Gazelle. And we are fortunate enough to have the actress Dominique Fishback, who originated the role, to bring this short play to you. We're going to start with that. So please welcome Dominique Fishback. Uh, Rashid, always trying to get us to stop beasting on each other. 
she, he, he called me, he called me just chest Giselle because I'm flat chested or whatever. <laughs> I don't care. I tell him, if I had big breasts like your older sister Tawny, I wouldn't be able to run as fast and I wouldn't be able to leave you choking on my dust when I run circles around your face on Friday. <laughs> Spider was in the middle, always between us. Like, chill, y'all. We all family at the end of the day. This block belong to us. It's home. It's our turf. We gonna get paid together. Spider always be trying to get us to be all PG and cartoon movie BFF acting. I mean, we do it for Spider. My we was crew cause of Spider. You just can't, you can't say no to Spider. He's just so skinny and funny. <laughs> and even though it sounds kind of weird to say it out loud, cause ain't none of us into the mushy in the soul, you kind of love Spider. Like also maybe even fall in love with him. <laughs> like maybe, a little bit. But I'm too young to know what love is, so maybe not. And anyway, love is corny. Love will make you lose a race. Game on. My mama started calling Spider Don King Jr. <laughs> no adult, adults invited to the big race, but we all got feelings they're gonna be watching from their windows. My mama offers to make me a Giselle the Gazelle t-shirt. I tell her I don't do rhymes, that's corny. <laughs> but she make me one anyway. I wear it cause I don't want her to feel whack, but I hate every bit of wearing it. She making me like a running baby doll. I got a feeling she not taking this race seriously. This is life or death. This is for equal rights and democracy for the only girl on every block. This is for neighborhood pride and respect. This is not a game, this is for real. But mama makes a shirt magenta. Ugh, I love magenta. I wear it, but I'm not smiling for pictures. A woman's gotta have her boundaries. Race day comes. It's a weird day. We in school just waiting for the bell to ring. Cause now folks in class done heard, and a five dollar pot is up to like a hundred dollars. I start to think of all the stuff I could buy with $50. I'm gonna invest it wisely. Won't spend it all in one place. Half will go under the mattress for a rainy day, and the other half towards this new 10 speed I've been eyeing at Greg's bike shop up the street. It's magenta with yellow stripes. It got Giselle's name written all over it. I'm gonna be rolling that baby up the street, past my sheet, like, what's up, yo, need a lift? Yeah. <laughs> I tell Spider my bike buying pants. He asked me if I'm ready. I tell him, I was born ready. My mom said I used to kick on her belly so hard, she thought I was trying to break through. She said she knew I had lightning in my feet even then. I got this race. Spider wasn't feeling good this day. He just kept walking so, dragging his feet. He looked like something was type heavy on his mind. I, kept, I asked him what was up. He wasn't saying nothing. He just kept looking away from me, playing it cool, saying he was as good as ever, but he wasn't. Something was up. I pissed him on his neck real hard until he pushed me. Aye, aye, yo! He said, we gotta move. What? All shit stopped. I thought my heart fell out of my body. I looked around on the ground to make sure. What? Moving where? To Cali? He said, what for? What's in Cali? My own house? Why you gotta go? My brother in trouble? Some cops came by the house last night looking for him. He do something? Nah, but he got these friends and, and, and maybe they did something. My mama said they the wrong influence. She can't take it no more. Said she gotta take us out, she gotta get us out before they take us all under. Why she don't just send your brother, Callie? Why you gotta go? Family stick together. That was all he said. But it sounded like he was saying a lot more. It sounded like he was saying goodbye forever. I didn't know what to do. So I just looked at him for a second, a really long second, and then I just kissed him right out of the blue. Ain't even sure what came up with me. I am not the kissing type. I was totally another Giselle. <laughs> but Spider kissed me back, though. He didn't even act weird or nothing. He just kissed me back, and it was soft, but not mushy. It was just, I don't even know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> he whispered in my ear, you ready for the race? I say, yup. He said, low key, I want you to win. I said, good. Then I asked him how he was gonna spend his $50. He said if I win, he was gonna put it towards my bike fund since he's moving and whatnot, like a going away present. I started to feel my eyes itch, like they wanted to cry, but I didn't, cause I never cry. Not even when my heart's breaking. I got a race to win. Ready? Set, we was on the starting line at the front of the block. Rashid had got his hair cut. He looked fresh and clean, but so what? I had my magenta 
Baby doll runner, Giselle the Gazelle t-shirt. My mama was looking from the window and waving. <laughs> Corny. Another mama, one uncle, Skinny J father, and Miss Jefferson with the blonde dog, they was all looking out their window. Well, Miss Jefferson was on the stoop, but everybody was there, and almost 20 kids from school. This had turned out to be the biggest race of my life. I, I stretched my calves, rotated my ankles, grabbed my elbows behind my back, no mistakes. Spider was gonna run too, just for kicks. Everybody knew he was no match for me and she, but he was just gonna run behind us for old time's sakes. Burst and Ernie was holding the banner at the other end of the block. I was keeping my eyes on the prize. Skinny J called it, on your march! We corrected him, on your marks. <laughs> Get set! I was sweating now, go! We was running like the wind. I could feel myself like elevating almost. My lungs was on fire. I could see Rashid in my peripheral. He was close, but I was pulling ahead. All sound disappeared. All I could hear was my own heart rate, my own feet bouncing against the street. I got closer to the banner, did see Rashid in sight. It was me, I was in the lead. I pulled it closer, closer, bang! Everybody talking to the sheets that said winner. I could hear the crowd screaming their voices like sirens. without she and spider. Everybody kept asking me if I was okay. The teachers kept asking me if I needed to talk. I didn't say nothing. I don't know if I'll ever say nothing again. My mama came to pick me up. She didn't want me walking by myself. Not while things were still so fragile, she said. Not while people are out there upset and confused. They killed Spider and Rashid. They were chasing those boys that hang with Spider's brother. They said they went running around our block. They said they just robbed the store. Nobody has seen those boys. They, they must be hiding good, but Rashid and Spider, everybody saw. And the officer said he yelled, stop. So he said he yelled it three times, but nobody heard nothing. We were running the race, nobody heard nothing. But everybody saw. My mama and me, we walked past Greg's bike shop. I saw the magenta tent speed with the yellow stripes. It was talking to me, but I didn't feel like talking back. Mama said, the students are gonna give Spider, gonna give money to Spider and Rashid's family. Did you wanna give anything? I said, Spider raised $100 from the race. I don't want my share. Can I go to the families? Mama smiled. You want to race me home, Mama asked. <coughs> I told her, I don't want to race no more. Mama said, one day, you're going to have to get back on the track. You can't let this knock the wind out of you forever. You just can't. I told her, didn't that officer know it was bad luck to kill a spider? Mm -hmm. Mama didn't answer. She just, kept, she just took a deep breath and kept walking. I still go to the track. 
I still perfect my stride. One day, I'm going to do Olympics, gold medals. One day, I'm going to be able to run without being afraid, but someday still, when my feet are moving fast and I can hear the wind in my ears, I look back to see who's running after me. I look back to see who's left behind. I look back to wipe a tear from my eye, even though I never cried. And I look ahead, and I keep running for Rashid, for Spider, for equal rights, for democracy, for the only girl on every block, for civil rights, and for everybody still in the race. On your march, <laughs> get set. Please give it up once more. And welcome Dominique Maurice up to the stage. Can we turn this off? Is that possible? Welcome Dominique. But as I think, um, can you talk a little bit about the piece we just saw, like where it came from and why you wrote it? Okay, yeah. Um, so uh, in Chicago, uh, American, oh my God, I'm gonna forget the American Theater Company, American Place Theater Company, one of those. Um, yeah, look it up for me, please. I'm sorry, Chicago. American Theater American, Company. American Theater Company. Um, it's been a minute, that's why. And uh, they had this thing where they were doing like a, it was in response to Ferguson. They had these pieces. They wanted people to write and. Uh, they were 10 minute plays and I just thought, oh, I wanna do a, a one woman, I wanna do a one woman play, you know, one girl play. Uh, because during the, the Ferguson especially, um, during the, the unrest that happened there, I just kept thinking, you know, we're, we're, we talk about the fragility of young black boys, you know, and that is not in disconnection with the fragility of young black girls. So I wanted to see the how that stuff lived in a black girl's, because uh, she's a witness. There we are all, we're not just um, getting taken out in the streets, we're also bearing witness. And the witnessing, it has its own uh, relationship to trauma, so I wanted to look at that. Um, can you tell us a bit of your own uh, writer origin story? Yeah. Why are you laughing? <laughs> because you, sorry, I don't been very well, you guys. <laughs> in the trenches together. Uh, yes, yes, teacher, coach, student, ex-girlfriend, whatever characters we can play. Um, and, uh, but my origin story, because there's an origin New York story, but the, No, before yeah, that. The before like that. When you were racing boys on the block. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, post racing boys on the block and pre-New uh, York, I went to Michigan and um, I was studying theater as an actress and we were not studying diverse writers at all. Um, and uh, you know, every now and again, Michelle Shea came to my school. I don't know if anybody knows yeah. Michelle Shea. Michelle Shea, okay. Yeah. Thanks for the people that know her. Um, is one of the original color girls and in, yeah. in, in Tazaki's for color girls on Broadway. And she is also, she's a wonderful director. She teaches at NYU. She came to Michigan. And Columbia. And Columbia, hello. And she came to Michigan and um, was our guest director. And she brought Alice Childress, the wedding band. And, um, and that sort of, that, that experience working with Michelle Shea was transformative to me. I craved working on stories like that, but we were not doing that without guest directors like her coming in. We were not studying that kind of stuff. And it definitely wasn't in our curriculum. So about my third year, I was ready to just like get out of there or do something different. Uh, and so for me, I thought, let me, I, I want to write something. And between my second year and my third year, the second year in college was a rough one. 
and I thought, you don't know if I belong here, you know what I mean? And, uh, and then I ended up saying, okay, well, I'm gonna write something, I'm gonna come back. I remember a teacher who recently retired from Michigan, but he did say to me when I thought I would wanna write plays, um, he said, to, a, to my entire acting class, by the way, Dominique needs to figure out whether she wants to write plays or be in them, <laughs> you know? And I thought, oh, okay, motherfucker, well, I'm gonna do both. <laughs> Back next year, I'm gonna write, direct, act. When you were first starting as a writer, were there people that you were looking to that were inspiring you? Or? Yeah, I mean, Intazaki was definitely Intazaki Sean Gay. You know, I was on, I was a poet. I had never written a play, so for me, spoken word and that scene was very hot when I was coming up in college, and I. It, through Color Girls, I figured out, oh, I can, I can be a poet as a playwright. That's, that was my transition into writing plays. So I was, I, my first play was a choreo poem. Um, not for nothing was very connected, you know, the blackest blues, time to change the tune, a sister story, that was that. Um, we, we used to fight a lot. Yes, we And we, I, I used to say, we, yes. we fight about poetry in yes, plays. Yes, we did, we I did. Get your poems out of your plays, save it for the slam. I was like, you don't know anything about it until and, and Dominique was right. It was, it was, I was, I'll say it publicly, you were right. Thank you. It was and then I'm poetry. Uh, is this on camera? Yeah. 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 This would be great for your future children that I can show this to. I'm so excited. Um, but yeah, you know, so for me, it was doing that. It was when I did that play in Michigan, I had everybody in it. Um, like, I mean, anybody that wanted to be in a play, that audition, I was like, well, I have a role, but what can you do, you know? <laughs> and they would come on and be, you know, a dancer or just like literally walk on stage, do this and leave, you know what I mean? Was, everybody from all departments, just, I just let everybody in there play. It was a three-woman show, had like a 20 cast. <laughs> and, um, you know, and it was great. I'm still very close to those people to this day. And they're like, you know, engineers and lawyers and whatever, but they like, fly out to New York just a couple of weeks ago to see Ain't Too Proud, you know, like we've been like this because we were black students having an experience at a predominantly white university, you know, and uh, and we have, we went through some fire together, literally, you know, and, um, and so that was that, but that moment of writing that play was transformative for not just me, that's when I knew I wanted to be a playwright, because I was like, oh, this is, other people need this. The world needs this. Yeah. Who, um, who, uh, who contemporary wise, who's inspiring you in your work? Uh, you know, well, I'm very, so I stand on the shoulders of Alice Childress, Pearl Clegg, Nubia Kai, Cheryl West, Ron Milner, you know, August Wilson, Lorraine Hansberry, right? But um, I am also very inspired. You know, I just was talking to Lynn Nottage yesterday, and uh, we were talking about you know, just like what permissions that we give each other through the I asked her, like, so who were your contemporaries, you know? And she said so many of her contemporaries, she lost to the AIDS epidemic, right? You know, so like, I can't even name all of her contemporaries. I was like, cause I don't, I don't, I feel ashamed that I don't know them. Uh, you know, I know some of them, like Dominic Taylor, it was a Talvin Wilkes, some of her contemporaries, you know. Um, but she also comes from the line of George Wolfe, you know. And so for me, I feel like I also stand on the shoulders of Lynn Nottage and I have become contemporaries, even though she's an elder to me, you know. Uh, Katori Hall, uh, Terrell Alvin McCraney, you know. Those are my contemporary peers. Marcus Garvey is one of my favorite writers. And, um, you know, so those are the people that I, uh, there's many more, but those are the ones. Ooh. I wanted to bring out uh, an article from uh, American Theater Magazine, which is our um, publication of record for the American Theater. Dominique, you guys know the article she wrote? Yes. Um, uh, it was a couple years ago. The title was Why I Almost Slapped a Fellow Theater Patron and What That Says About Our Theaters. Um, and you can look it up and read the whole thing. I'm just going to read the end of it, um, the last two uh, paragraphs. Um, in writing this account, I wondered whether I should name this, so what, so maybe I should say the account. Um, someone tried to shush Dominique at a play, um, and it escalated, and it brought up issues about, tell me if I'm saying this wrong, uh, white privilege and racism in the American theater, and what's an acceptable response to art, specifically black art. Um, so, and they, they didn't know who they were talking to, and they shouldn't have talked to anyone like so Dominique has a platform, so she wrote an article. Um, in writing this account, I wondered whether I should name the specific theater of my experience. I chose anonymity, 
Not to inspire a guessing game among my readers, but to avoid narrowing the issue. This isn't a matter of a one or two theaters. This is about us all. This elitist culture is a Frankenstein created collectively and it will take collective action to shift to a model of inclusion. Institutional leaders have to be the ones to set the tone for this kind of environment. We need to say with our plays, with our programming, with the overall culture we set in the theater, or else we continue to foster a community of racial privilege and entitlement in the theater regardless of how many people of color there are on stage. Um, so I wanna, that was three years ago. Um, and supposedly we have one of the most diverse seasons in New York City in this moment, which is a good thing. Um, how are you, are things moving in the right direction? What is the change you wanna see? How do we get there? Where are we at? I was just listening to that, like, oh, I know a few people I need to share that with right now. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna swallow that for a minute. <laughs> and I do think that, um, I think that we're, like everything, we're moving forward and backwards at the same time. You know, um, hopefully we're gonna keep taking more steps forward than backward, but I do think we do it from backwards. Mm. Uh, and you know, there is a very diverse season right now. Um, I don't know, I don't know what diverse means to us right now, but there is, there's a lot of um, more people of color being programmed than there have been in a long time, right? There's a lot more black playwrights being programmed right now than ever before in a, in a New York season. Uh, but I also look at that stuff like, oh, this is, um, you know, we can be really, we can be real hot topic real quick, like, you know, like Wendy Williams Hot Five or something, <laughs> and then we can just disappear, you know? And so I sort of kind of feel, I'm, I'm a little, I'm cautiously optimistic mm -hmm. about what's happening right now. I, I don't know that everybody, you know, you can really look like a hater if you're like, are we putting developed work out, you know? Are we just going right away with whatever's coming out of whatever school or whatever, you know? And I don't, I don't feel that. I, I believe that I wanna see the, our voices cultivated as a, as a community of writers, but I do not wanna see us settle for not getting what we need from our work. Right. Is this a moment or a paradigm shift? That's what I'm saying. I, don't, I want it to not be a moment. I want it to be a movement. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I, I am skeptical of the curation of it. The so curation say more about that. It feels like a moment. It feels like, um, ooh, do you have one at your theater? Let's look at who's coming out. Let's pick your grab. Grab this one, grab that one. We gotta find the next hot one. And they'll, and they'll say, oh, this is the next Dominique. We this is the next, I was yeah. called the next Katori, yeah. and me and Katori was like, same age, and doing stuff. I'm like, what? I'm the next Katori, she's still here. What are we talking about? <laughs> you know, where's she going? She's not going anywhere. <laughs> so, I mean, I think it's something, we can't let people do that to us, and I think the way that we can't let them is, even when they give us opportunities in, in their spaces, we still have to demand and ask for ourselves the cultivation and the development that we deserve. And we're, if we're not getting developed, if we're going, hey, right here and then go right there, you gotta, be, you gotta ask some questions, what you doing to me? Because I don't wanna be here today going tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And if you just put me out there before I'm ready, you're not taking care of me, it's weird. You know, it's like, I don't need you to celebrate my mediocrity. I'm, I, I, I am capable of excellence, and I, need, I deserve the right platform to get me to do, create excellence. And I think that we have to sort of get our egos out of the way and go, wait a minute, no, no, no. I've been asked to, for instance, I have been asked to take shows to Broadway before. And I'm like, no, I don't think that's a Broadway. I, no, that, that belongs over here where I can work that out. But that's not a Broadway show. You're just going to throw some star on it and make me look crazy. No, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. And we have to be able to say no to things that don't feel um, fully organically accurate for what we're trying to do. Speaking of stars and looking crazy, um, you you were for many years, I know you, we all know you're from Detroit, you rep, you rep Detroit, but um, Brooklyn claimed you and, and New York City theater community claimed you for many years and um, not long ago you, you made the move out to Los Angeles. Um, how's that been? <laughs> stars are looking crazy. My transitions are choppy. That <laughs> um, wasn't a good transition. <laughs> uh, listen, I, I, I have made the move to LA. Um, that is where I live now. Uh, Brooklyn claimed me and then and kicked me out. Um, <laughs> gentrified my ass right out. <laughs> and uh, but I. Um, 
I now have me work in television. Uh, what you want to know about it? I mean, what, what's the thing you want me to say about it? What's the what, what was the biggest difference? You were you were an established writer in New York, and you and you went out to L.A. and then now you're based in L.A. What's it like? Yeah, I mean your, your credits don't transfer, so nobody cares about how whatever you want in New York City. I mean it's like oh that's so nice, and no one cares, you know? It's like oh this is the so and so winner. Oh you won the such and such. That's so nice. No one cares, you know? And um, because in L.A. that's a whole different bracket, and and the credits don't transfer. So I mean it's actually cool for me because I'm just like I'm gonna just learn this medium. Um, television writing is, is, is faster, it's fair factory, you know? It's like, you know, tell this story in this many minutes, <laughs> you know, and get that sucker out. You don't have all day to get inspired, do you know what I mean? Um, that you need to turn that draft around by Tuesday, and if you don't do it, somebody's gonna rewrite you. Somebody will write this by Tuesday. <laughs> it could be you, or it could be the, you know. And so, it's a very different muscle. Um, for me, it just teaches me, it has taught me lack of preciousness and reverence for the writing sometimes. Not everything I write is gold, and it, but it will be on TV. <laughs> it will go to the biggest audience <laughs> that there is for my work and not be the best thing that I ever wrote. And I'm okay. I was freaking out about it the first time. Like, oh my God, I don't, oh God, this is a, you know, Shameless is tricky. I wrote on Shameless, and that's a tricky show, because uh, that is satire. And I find that satire, I don't, I no longer write on Shameless. I left uh, after three seasons. I left after season eight. Um, and uh, I just find satire in an age of Trump complicated. I don't know who's, who we laughing at. Who's the joke? Who's the joke? And you know, on those shows like Family Guy and South Park, those shows, they kind of get everybody. You know, like nobody's, no, no community's off limits and nothing's sacred, you know? Um, there's space for that, but for me, for right now, as a writer of color, and the only writer of color that was in that room, um, that was, uh, that I, I, it went its course for me, and, mm -hmm. and then I learned what I needed to from some really smart people in the middle out. Okay. There's a lot of uh, writers in the room, different mediums, um, and students in the room. Do you, what, what advice would you give to people kind of uh, earlier on in their careers, let's say? Uh, depends on which part of their we'll say, we'll, so we'll say, we'll say they're in New York, they want to do theater. I think if you want to act in theater, it's kind of different than if you want to write in theater, but I think in general, for theater artists, I, I really do want us all to think of ourselves as storytellers first. You know, if we could forget this shit really fast and turn into something else, you know? Um, I think if you forget your storytelling, you start getting caught up on other things that are not important. I think if you remember that you're a storyteller, you let that be the guide for picking the work that you do, for the work that you try to go out for, for the way that you see yourself as an entity in this business. Um, and so you, if you're led by story, then you know how to serve story. So your ego gets out of the way. As a writer and an actor, a director, your ego gets out of the way when you become in service to narratives. You know, like these are, these, my, I, the, the people that matter the most to me, and I care a lot about actors, I fight, I advocate for actors. I advocate for actors on Ain't Too Proud. You know, I, I fight a lot for my directors. I fight for whoever. But nobody's more important or more worth advocacy than the characters that I write. Let me ask you, was this, uh, this understanding of the importance of narrative and serving a story, was this something that was natural to you, something you had to learn along the way? How did you, how did you get that? I think I increasingly Learn. I, I, I guess I learned it more and more firmly along the way. I think, you know, I get back to, I call it the factor, the why factor, like you gotta know why you're doing something, because you'll lose it, you'll lose it every time, but if you kind of know why you're creating work, that for me is, is my origin. I sat at Michigan, I wanted to tell a story about, I was going, I was frustrated, and I wanted to do something to reclaim myself at my school, on stage, in front of my department. Right, and that was my why, that's what drove me. But when I did that, so many other people who felt invisible in their departments also felt illuminated. And that's when I say, when you realize that you're doing something that's bigger than you, is because the why becomes great. It becomes really wide and vast. And I, I think it grows, but I do think, um, so I think, it, you, I think it's the root, actually, and not the, the something I grab later. It depends, it's like if you're doing this from the outside in or the inside out. It doesn't matter. 
You can, however you learn it. I just, I do think you have to be clear about, we are artists, so we are in service. And you forget the servitude of this. I mean, and I like to say, I like to serve the underprivileged. I don't, I don't serve privilege, but I do serve underprivileged, you know? I serve the misrepresented and the underrepresented, and that's who I'm telling stories about. So they will always come first to me. Now we're, we're at uh, an educational institute. We're at St. Francis College, and um, there is arts training here. There are people here studying playwriting. What, what is the shift you'd like to see as far, because you had to kind of pave your own way and, and bump up against the department. What would you like to see as far as arts education, um, that shift? Uh, I want to see a major revolution happen in these conservatory programs and these training programs and these theaters. A major revolution because I think that that school, school is actually where the first place where you learn inferiority. Mm. I think that when we're taught like our gods are the people, you know, here's your god, here's who you should bow down to, and if you don't know anything about these dead white men, then yeah. you are a failure. And, that's right. and, um, and I go, but who even said that that was my paradigm? Like that's not even my paradigm. Why are you measuring me on something that's not my paradigm? You know, that doesn't make any sense. If you don't know Pearl Clegg and Alice Childress, you're not even equipped to, um, to critique my work. Yeah, it goes really. back to theater critics. It goes too. back to theater critics, right? So to me, uh, edu but education and, 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 and programs, training programs, do a lot of that filtering of what will, what will then be taken back and brought into the field, you know? Is it about, is it about um, expanding the canon? Getting rid of the canon, making a new canon. I think I'm making a new canon. I'm okay. sorry, I'm a radical. No, no, no I, I'm, I, I'm. I'm about yeah. radical change yeah. because I do think we can, I've tried a little incremental change, and it doesn't move the needle enough. Yeah, you know, the raising in the sun, having, getting tossed in there. Yeah, yeah, it's not enough. It's not enough because it's placating, and I think if you're really trying to, you know, if you're really trying to teach um, a new way. If you're really trying to teach the world that we want to see and not the world we've always known, I think you have to create that world. You have to say, this is going to be, you know, we're gonna study no dead white men, actually. We're gonna study all living people of color, or we're gonna study women this time, you know? We're gonna, we're gonna do something different because the world that exists as it is is imbalanced. And sometimes to create balance, you have to tip the scales the other way. And not always. You know, but I do think, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm a, I don't want to detract from the love that everyone has for Shakespeare, for instance, right? Because I do think Shakespeare, I mean, Shakespeare's a value dude, you know? <laughs> I've got some value, some, a lot of value from Shakespeare's work. But how many productions does Shakespeare really need? I mean, who's eating off of these productions? <laughs> he doesn't have a family to feed, right? Now, what are we doing? You know, like, why are we focusing so much on that and not on, others that are also, let's look at, I mean, if you want to go back, there's like, there are, you know, Shakespeare didn't invent this shit, you know? There are other cultures. There are, you know, Mexican culture, you know, there are Afro-Caribbean culture. There's a lot of people. Yes, absolutely. And so let's study some of his influences. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, how we How we doing on time? What time is it? <laughs> so I just want to make sure we have enough time for the Q&A. Five to eight. What? Five to eight. Five to eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, great. Um, okay, I want, to, I want to switch topics for a second. No, this the shakes. I know I have to say that because people take it personally, you know what I mean? I'm not trying to well, it's interesting. You know, I, and I, already dead. I don't know if we talked about it. Um, uh, James Baldwin has a pretty famous essay about how I had to get over hating Shakespeare um, and his, his struggles with that, which is a struggle with white supremacy. And, that, and the canon is part of that. Um, and Shakespeare can be good outside of that. Yeah. Um, but I want to change the topic, um, if I can, uh, to something I don't always get to hear you talk about. Uh, so, so, so Dominique is part of a lot of communities. A lot of people claim her. Um, and I was part of a community that Dominique. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to roast you. Relax. <laughs> Where are you going with this, Dominique? Okay. I don't trust me. Ben, we have, we have history. Uh, <laughs> If there's more time, I'll tell other stories. Yeah, sure. But, but I, what I want to... <laughs> so Dominique, um, Dominique uh, has a partner, a husband named Jimmy, Jimmy Keys, yes. um, who's also an artist. And they've been together forever, um, or as long as I've known Dominique. And, and, um, Almost and, 20 years. Yeah. 
And for a lot of us, for, you know, when we were in our 20s, for, for I'm gonna speak for a group of people I have no business speaking for, but I'm gonna speak for them. <laughs> we we kind of, we look to them as a model of a healthy relationship and as uh, artists in relationship and people inspired by each other. Um, and I want to talk, actually I wanted to read something that Jimmy wrote. Um, Dominique's birthday was recently. Yeah. And, um, Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday. Um, and I, I really like what he wrote on Facebook, so I'm going to read it. <laughs> but I think it's relevant. I think it's relevant to what we're talking about. This is Jimmy's words. And I got permission I'm sure to read this. Um, it is no mistake that she was born on 313. That's the area code for Detroit, for yeah. those of you that didn't know. She reps the D with grace, passion, integrity, humility, sincerity, and devotion. Though we from the hometown get to lay first claim to her, like she always says, when you talk about Detroit, you're talking about black people. So in that sense, black people also get to lay first claim to her. She is truly a humanitarian and a champion of the underrepresented. So 90% of the world's population can lay first claim to her. <laughs> when she writes our people, she does so with love, with tough love, with compassion, with empathy, with fervor, with hope, with belief, with strength, and most importantly, with honesty. How does she do so? Easily, because all these things are her. She walks around the house talking out the issues that keep her, and consequently me, up at night. <laughs> she has a heart so big she can't help but see the macro and the micro. She walks through this earth with a generosity unparalleled. She inspires the people in her life to reach their highest self. She has pushed me to be a better man, and my life is so full because of her. I don't know how I got so lucky, but I'm grateful every day, especially every 3.13. Aww. That's from Jimmy. I do good writing. I do good writing. He's a good writer. Um, so I want to talk about a few things that brings up for me. What is it, and, and I know people, we used to talk about this, and people would be like, oh, Dominique is, you know, you have it easy, you got Jimmy. Um, and it's like, no, actually relationships are work. They're always work. What is, how do you, how do you as an artist, as a young artist, because you, it seemed like y'all had figured that out early, and I don't know, I wasn't, you know, spying on you. But, um, what, do you have advice? Because we, we struggle in arts and we struggle in love, and they're related. Our, our, our personal life is our political life, is our artistic life. Give us some wisdom. No. <laughs> no, I do not have wisdom. Um, I, I don't have wisdom. I'm still learning. I do not know. Uh, I am I, also very lucky. Jimmy is a really amazing man, and he... Um, we grew up together, so we also both are very lucky in that we um, found each other very early in life, and um, you know, in college, and we were on board. With, uh, we were friends. We were friends, and we. Why were, is that important? Oh, that's all you're gonna have left at the end. <laughs> I mean, you got you better be friends. Do you know what I mean? A lot of stuff's gonna fade. You're gonna get sick. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna, your body's gonna change. Everything's gonna change, but the friendship is the thing that's gonna stay. That's gonna remain the, the, the root foundation. It's the thing that, I mean, you know, I, I need a man that can make me laugh. You know, I got to have humor in my life. Like, life can be joyless, a joyless asshole sometimes. And like, without, like, laughter, I'm dead. So, you know, to me, that friendship, uh, but we were friends, and I look at relationships, I don't know the answer, but all I can, I look at every relationship like friendship. If you can be a good friend, if you can learn what being a good friend means, you can also be a good partner for somebody. And I think people don't know how to be good friends. You know, I look at things like, I mean, look, infidelity is not a, a, is not a you know, it's a complicated thing. I look at certain kinds of infidelity, like, damn, that's not even being a good friend. Like, you just, like, put this person, like, you're not even taking care of this person's spirit right now. <laughs> like, that's not even, we're not talking about your own flat impulses or something. I'm talking about, like, friendship, you know? Um, 
I think one time Jimmy said something to you. Oh, once uh, did I tell you? I don't remember who said it, but now. Nah. What was? Yeah, I was, it was in, I was in pictures. A, remember that uh, no. uh, about like um. I think you were asking something when you're dealing with a relationship. Yeah, I was dealing with a lot of relationships. You're dealing with a lot of relationships. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I said, you know, Jimmy's thing is, and when it comes to like commitment or like the tough stuff, you know, he goes like, when you get old, like all you have is memories. And memories are basically like these photos, like you can like snap these photos in your mind at these moments, you know? And so he's always like, I just want to have a bunch of good memories. So I'm trying to make good memories right now. You know, so I'm trying to, I don't want to live in a moment where I'm going to feel like it might have felt good for two seconds, but in the memory, that's going to feel real bad. I don't want to do that, you know? So we just try to make good pictures, good memories, you know? Um, and I, and I, there's a lot of other complicated stuff. He's an artist. He is a very good artist, and he's a music artist, and he's also really supportive of my art, and I'm really supportive of his art, and our art has not always moved in concert at the same time together, and that is hard. That is hard. You know, um, because while I'm in my light, you know, he's standing in support of my light. And what about his light? You know, but he's very, we're very aware. I mean, there have been moments in our history, because we've been together almost 20 years, where he's been in his light. He was much more in his light in college than me, you know? And, uh, and I was just in support of his light. And we have these ebbs and flows of, you know, you'll, you'll be centered. Let's put the energy behind where, where it was moving for us. We moved to where it was moving to us, you know. Um, but it's complicated. And I think the only thing that gets us through all of the hard traveling and distances and also the, the wear and tear of the industry of the art, because I love the art, he loves the art. At the purity of the art, that will always be our saving grace. But the industry of the art can really, really molest the art. And you really have to protect the art from the industry. You have to. And yet, try to find a way to navigate the industry, because the industry is the, is the means to be able to consistently do the art in a visible way. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy says she walks around the house talking out the issues that keep her up at night. What's she trying to? Okay, what, yeah. So what's what's uh, it's 2019? Where where what's keeping you up at night right now? What are you trying to deal with through your art? But what, um, what's most pressing to you as far as things you wanna? Um, I I'm tired of the white gaze on my work. Huh. I'm, it's hard. This, when you say that, you mean critics or I mean, audience I mean members? Critics, or everybody? I mean the, I mean the, I beyond critics. You know, I think because we can get real small talking with critics. I don't actually have anything against like a person's opinion about my work. I really don't. Yeah. Um, I have a problem with the systemizing of that. And it's opinion. not real criticism. Yeah, it's not real. A, criticism is an art. What, yeah. What, sure. what most of these newspapers do is not that. That's, that's personal preference, that's opinion, that's not real criticism. Criticism yeah, exactly. puts your work in con context with the work it speaks to. That's right. And that's not what's happening. I think really great criticism, really great journalism is, a, is actually about getting others to weigh in and, and think critically and, mm -hmm. and challenge thinking around work, yeah. right? It's not to thumbs up, thumb down some work. What is that? What is that? That does nothing for me. That does not help the culture. But it is it is permeating in the culture. And I, I, I am very, I feel very oppressed by mm -hmm. the white gays. And um, I don't mean I'm going to stop. Now, it doesn't mean I'm, gonna, I'm going to succumb to the oppression. Mm -hmm. You said, what'd you say? Don't look at me. What? <laughs> the white gays. <laughs> um, no, shut up. Anybody looking at you? You talking about <laughs> But I feel that I feel exhausted by navigating it in spaces. I feel like we, we pander to it in a way in theater that and we pander to it everywhere. And I just it's like I'm tired. I don't want to bow to white supremacy. Is really what is good. the movement that you're gonna start or you want to get behind to challenge that, overturn that, shift that? I mean, some of it I can't talk about. Okay. Some you can't be you can't be public with it. Some of it has okay. to be. If you're gonna subvert something, you can't always announce it. That's fair. You know, but I, you know, I think slowly but surely I am, I am, I am hoping to ignite a younger generation. So we'll hear about it soon enough. Yeah, okay. I'm hoping that we will learn to unplug, you know, and to create our own paradigm and to take up space unapologetically in spaces. 
and to um, and to demand that our full three, you know, that our full three-dimensional selves can come into the room, and that our communities have to come with us. Yes, you you've always um, put yourself out there for young people, all young people, um, mm -hmm. and. Um, what does it mean to you as an artist to, to show up for young artists and to, and to be a mentor and to be, to be that to people? I mean, I don't even understand people not doing it. I don't, it's like, it, it kind of baffles me. It, it baffles, you know, I remember one time I talked to an agent. He's not my agent, but an agent. And I remember, you know, I was talking about like some young people I was gonna talk to and they, and they kind of spoke about it like, oh, that's so cute, she's so charitable. And I was like, you missing it, dude. Like, you missing. Do you want to be here tomorrow? You better rock with these young people. This is their world. It's not yours. It's their world. I don't even understand. I'm just trying to have a place in the world, young people. I'm just trying to stay in your world. Do you know what I mean? I just hope you would keep me around in your world. Because I know whose world it is. And I, th I just don't think that everybody, I don't think everybody gets that. I think that's why you have an old guard that won't let a young guard in, politically or creatively or whatever, because they just don't understand whose world it really is. And I understand very clearly there's always been young people's world. They have always been on the vanguard of every revolution. I'm just trying not to get left behind. Fair enough. Um, so, uh, would you like to hear Dominique perform a little bit? Yeah. Uh, a, one of my other favorite pieces of Dominique's uh, is it actually, I would call it a poem. Um, and it's a, it, it, it speaks to her commitments to young people. Would you mind, would you mind uh, blessing us with... Uh, I forgot about this man. Yes, I will. Do you I'm still know it? I, I hope so. What's what happens? I'm gonna step, I'm gonna step away from this. I don't need to move furniture like that. <laughs> this is not gonna be nearly as, in, yeah, as expressive as Dom, the other Dom. Um, okay, but this is, uh, this is called Hardcore, and this is, is this. Keisha was rowdy. She was rowdy. She was Keisha. She was rowdy. <laughs> 13 and the shit rides number 15 bus to Fulton Street and we are all her audience. She chews her gum hard. <laughs> Not hard like the surface of a frozen ice block hard, but hard like her mama works late night double shifts hard. Hard like the teeth <laughs> must stab each bubble in the gum hard. Hard like growing up is hard. Hard like falling in love hard. Hard like the core of an I don't give a fuck attitude hard. She chews her gum hard. And we should all be afraid. Keisha's hair is orange today, don't fuck with her. <laughs> orange is lion. Orange is fire. Orange is, I dare you to say one bad thing about my hair. And Keisha is everything orange is, and more of what orange ain't. Keisha skips school today. Like almost every day when the afternoon sun is high and all other 13 year olds are in the middle of their junior high literary boredom, Keisha is clever. Riding number 15 buses to Fulton Street and smiling inside her rebellion. She thinks it's her personal secret. She thinks we don't know she's only 13. She couldn't give a fuck less if we did. <laughs> Keisha has friends today. They munch candy. Now and later, give them color miles. Red tongues, purple lips, blue teeth, green palettes. They are a rainbow coalition of candy smiles. Keisha and crew laugh, they are loud, the three of them must be shaken from the roar of their gossip. Someone so got to a fight with someone so, someone so was talking to someone so man, they politic. If it was me, I'd be someone so's ass too, cause can't nobody mess with my man. Man be measuring stick to Keisha and crew's work. They check a tire, cut scissors down the middle. Cleavage bulges out and greets the onlookers. I am one of them. Mesmerized by their danger. Keisha pulls out a tube of lipstick, scarlet. They pass the crimson crayon, color their lips in blood-colored sass, and prepare themselves for the older guys awaiting them at Fulton Street. It's on now. They are ready, so they think, to defy the rules of their adolescence and meet their womanhood dead on. 
I look at Keisha. She stares out of the smeared plexiglass window, and I wonder what she sees. Wonder how far her vision carries, if she sees herself behind her defiance. I stare at her hard, harder than Keisha's gum too hard. I can't help my gaze. Keisha catches my eyes, we are locked. I stare into the tornadoes, which are her pupils, and lose myself inside her fierceness. Her gaze dares me, defies me, begs me to speak, to, to say something urgent, begging me to tell her that, that she should be in school, to, to cover up her cleavage, to, to stop eating so much candy or she'll bite her teeth. But I am too ashamed of the familiarity to say anything at all. There's nothing my eyes tell her. Nothing I can say that'll stop you now. You bad, gone, be bad then. The bus gets to Fulton Street, Keisha and crew get off. I slide over and look out of the smeared plexiglass window that Keisha looked through only moments ago, seeing a similar emptiness of vision. I watch as the bus leaves them in the distance, choking on the bus fumes as we drove away, leaving them to Fulton Street, leaving them to the older guys while I move on to other places. I don't know Keisha. Keisha don't know me. We are strangers on the same route, going to a somewhere and nowhere simultaneously. And she could give a fuck less who I am, a fuck less well, who but me, but Keisha don't. She could give a fuck less who I am, and I could too. <laughs> But when I think of Keisha and her crew, I give a fuck. I give a huge fuck about Keisha, I do. And I beg to the crimson gods that anoint her lips and force me to recognize the picture of my own youth. That one day, Keisha might give a fuck to. I think we're gonna, uh, you guys got some good questions? Yeah. <laughs> I think we're gonna open it up. Um, where's that microphone? You got it. Um, so we're going to, is anyone, do we need to, no, we can see each other. Do we wanna get more lights? Is this okay? Keep it like this, okay. So if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll try to get to everybody. I'm gonna start going this way. That's what I saw, yes. Maybe say your name and then your question. Hi, my name is Kristen. I, um, I go to Columbia. Um, I'm in their MFA acting program. Um, and so I know that you spoke about the territories and not having enough of us in the room. Mm -hmm. I'm the only black girl in the class of 18. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? Like when you were in school, how did you deal with that? Um, well, when I was at Michigan, they were eventually, there were myself and my uh, roommate at the time, I moved from Detroit with Angela Lewis, who is now on Snowfall. And, um, and she and I, we were the only two black girls in our department. Um, and we, we moved very differently in the world, she and I, but we both were uh, sort of trying to navigate ourselves. I think by the time I got to my senior year, there were three of us. Right, um, but that didn't change who I am in the department. I I had to do things, you know, like start my write my own way, you know. Um, I challenged my department and, and and in ways that I mean exhausted them, you know, put a target on my back, but also got me a scholarship, you know. And so there was like a there becomes this moment, this thin line of are you going to be a troublemaker and what kind of trouble do you make? Good trouble, bad trouble, right? That's right. Be a troublemaker. John Lewis said. John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, SNCC member John Lewis, one of the heroes of our nation and the civil rights movement, looked me in my face and said, "You got to get in good trouble." So I'm gonna look you in your face and tell you, you got to stay in good trouble with your school. And, and, and be a good kind of disruptor about making space for you and your peers 
Because it's not just the benefit of the black people to learn about the black people and the benefit of the Latinx people to learn about the Latinx people, right? It's the benefit of all of us to learn about each other. And we need to all be as expert on each other as so many of us have been on white culture, right? Like that's how we actually learn about each other as a human family, and that's how we avoid the shit that we've been experiencing in our country as of late, right? So that I, be in getting that good trouble. Go ahead. Hello. Yeah. My name is Jasmine. Um, kind of piggybacking off that, but also you didn't get into your New York origin story. But when you arrived here, one of the issues I find, I've been here for a while now, one of the issues that I find is I still don't feel like I am in the black theater community here. And I feel like it's something that you have to be initiated into, and it just feels very isolating. Um, and so I wonder, how did you navigate and how did you uh, make yourself shown and, and you know and put yourself into the, the community here? Um, that's a great question. How long has I been here a while? 2011. Okay, I'm, I'm saying that because I, you know, around 2010, is when I joined the emerging uh, writers group at the public and found a new community, right? Prior to that, I'd been here for nine years, right? It took me nine years, really 10, to get into another kind of village to creating another kind of art, right? Um, and then to start getting visibility. My first play in New York City even though I've been here since 2001, the, the, pro the way that we know each other is because of 2002, I joined Creative Arts Team. So a lot of my village came from that place, from, um, we were at NYU and then we moved to City University of New York. And the Hip Hop Theater Festival. And then Hip Hop Theater Festival, right, which was started by, you know, Danny Hop, Clyde Valentine, Camilla Forbes, right? And they are now our peers at all, the, Camille is now running the Apollo. Clyde is where, where is he taking In Dallas. In Dallas, you know? And so many, and Danny Hawk is this, the enigma that is Danny Hawk. the solo <laughs> show, that is Danny Hawk. And so, um, and I, I'm saying that because those are peers, those are peers that we were building with each other. So the community that you're experiencing now that might feel like this, this I don't know what that black theater community is or feels like from when you don't feel a part of it, but all it is is a collection of peers, right, that decided to start creating together. So rather than, I think that that is more expansive than we think. It is about showing up for work and being present often at events, right, but it is also creating continuing to expand that community by creating and building with your own peers. Because n nothing will ever be as powerful as coming up with the people around you. Because those people will be taking over all of these institutions, I guarantee it, right? And so it is important to, to not only try to get, be active, go volunteer and be a part of things at, like, you know, at the National Black Theater, at the New Black Fest, come around those things. I want to say that to everybody. Come around the things that you want to be a part of and show up and say, what can I do? Because that was another thing that I did in building community with peers is I would see some of my friends, now friends, people I didn't know. I'd go to their events and i feel inspired and I wanted to be a part of it. And I didn't necessarily, my play was not necessarily going to be produced there. But I thought, I noticed that you don't have programs and I have a day job where I could print. <laughs> Do you need programs, sister? <laughs> right? And let me just show up and offer. So I think, when I think of a service, I think of what we have to offer each other, just collectively barter trading, right? How can I show up and make offers? And that's one way to build community across the board, culturally and gender identity-wise, is about showing up for each other and saying, what do you need? I think I can help find the fill in the gap, right? And not everybody needs something, so don't, don't, if they say nothing, then move to the people that need. Because you can't service people that don't want to be serviced. And Dominique did endless readings in her living room and holiday parties that became a black theater event, um, ultimately, so like creating that. I, I'm not speaking for that. No, no, but no. But I was at the party. You were at the black theater party. Um, but, and I think it is just literally about expanding. I think peers have to do this for each other. I don't believe in networking. That is like, what is that? I don't, I don't even know what that is. It's awful. We teach it in a way that it's awful. It's like, go up and tell everybody your resume. 
Nobody wants that. No, I don't want it. I don't know, but I, that don't mean nothing to me. You can tell me whoever you love work. It's, you, people do that because they, they're trying to say, make, build community, and they don't know how to say that. But what we're really trying to do is build community. We're trying to say, hey, what are you on? What's your mind on? This is what my mind's on. We share mind. We share like mind. Let's build. That's the thing, you know? So I would put the charge on um, showing up, being at these spaces, and find who's on the mind, who's got the mind that you're on. Because it's not about the work. I mean, the work is just a reflection of what's on our minds. So get in touch with each other's uh, mind. Yeah. Are you here? And then we'll come back to y'all, too. Hi, Dominique. My name is Kim. Hi. So since you're in L.A. now, I was, uh, and you mentioned that last night I was watching This Is Us. Um, Susan Collette, you're watching, and Sterling K. Yeah. Brown. Yeah. Do you think you could write for that show? Or, or <laughs> uh, I mean, sure, I could write for anything. I think if I wanted to and if it, it felt aligned, I mean, I love Susan and, and Susan Sterling, those are friends of mine, and Ron Cephas Jones, who was on their first season, you know, um, that been, you know, I've met Ron through Ben, actually, and through Labyrinth Theater and, and uh, development artists that are Woo! in the building. Hello, Woo! shout out to development artists in the building. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, I think it's a great show, and I think there's great writing on it, but I don't necessarily, you know, I think there's a time when you get into writing for other people, and then there's a time when you go, okay, I'm tired of telling other people's stories, I got my own. Yes. And so I'm always gonna come. I will serve. I like to serve other stories that I believe in, um, or that I can learn something from. Shameless, I can learn a lot from. And I actually did believe in a lot of things that we did on that show. Not everything, but a lot. Um, but I take that as information, and now I'm ready to go do take that <coughs> lesson and go apply it to my own stuff. Yeah. We'll flow back this way in the back and into the front. Hi, I'm Nancy. I am an actor, a uh, business school turned actor, and I've been dealing with like my first major rejections lately, and I know it's like, what I've read on the internet, so it's never ending. I was wondering if you also had a hard time with that, and how did you, how are you dealing with that? Um, I'm sure maybe you still face it. Yeah, oh, oh, it's a lifelong journey. I will say get on board for the lifelong rejection track. <laughs> it is lifelong. You know, it is lifelong. Again, I was talking to Lynn Nottage, two-time Pulitzer winner, only woman to ever win two Pulitzers, Lynn Nottage. And we talk about the, the losses, the battles we fight and the losses. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot of rejection. And I don't think we should even focus on the rejection because you can't focus on the things that are not working. You have to focus on the things that you have power over. We do not have power over who is ready to select us. And I think if, again, if you think of yourself as a storyteller, not as a parade, not as, you know, a, a, not even as a star for somebody to pluck out of the sky or a piece of fruit for somebody to take off a tree. You're the tree, you grow the fruit, right? So then you are not to be picked, you have something to offer as a storyteller. I think the fulfillment. Listen. <laughs> what you going to trade fruit? Um, but I do think that we have to think of ourselves. And so when you think of yourself as a storyteller, for instance, nobody can reject you from telling stories. No, they can't, you know? They can only say, you're not the right whatever we're looking for to tell this story in the way that we imagine. Mm -hmm. Right? You cannot combat somebody's imagination. Don't try. Mm -hmm. You showing up and offering and keeping moving. You're serving that work for that five seconds. You're in that room or that whatever. That's all we can do. And you can also, you have the power as actors. You have the power to tell stories. Maybe you're not a writer, but you have a relationship with other people who do write. Mm -hmm. You guys need each other. Use each other now. Don't wait till they get on TV. You won't get them then. Use them now. Do you know what I mean? I'm done with trying to, all my friends that I, you know, could reach out to them, oh, what, oh, she's on the shy free, okay. Oh, he's, well, okay, fine, I guess we won't, oh, well, he's shooting with Terrell this year, okay, I'm done. They're done, they're gone. Who's next? Who got next? Right, you know, so you're the storyteller. You can always find work that you like, that you're excited about. You can get with your other actor friends and say, hey, I love this blah, blah, blah play nobody's been thinking about for five and a half years or whatever. Y'all wanna just put some money together to do a showcase night? Mm -hmm. Like, build, 
feel, you do not have to wait to be seen. I'm gonna say another time I was wrong. I used to tell Dominique, quit casting your friends. You're always <laughs> quitting your friends. And now I'm like, can I get your friend's number? <laughs> um, but it's, it is, it's really good to build your own ensemble. So there was a hand in the back here. Hey, it's me, Dominique. Oh. Hey. 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 Um, I, it's my question is, because uh, you talked about going to LA and the writing was different, the, the pace of writing. I guess I would ask, how did you or how are you developing that faster pace writing style? Because I fear it. Yeah, well, I feared it a lot. Um, I mean, I fear it a lot. I, I just try to just do things I'm afraid of. I mean, you know, the only way to conquer fear is to actually just dance with it. And, and, and I don't, I'm not over it. I'm never over fear. I have fear about putting up a Broadway show. I have fear about everything. I call my spiritual counsel like, I need a session. We about to open this show. <laughs> Keep me on the ground. You know, um, but I think we have to move into into the things that scare us, and so joining. But then I have to remember when I'm in those spaces and I'm terrified. I am a storyteller. I know how to tell stories. That's the base. That's my baseline. <coughs> so oh, okay, it's a different way of telling stories, but I still know how to tell stories. I know when a story feels like it's working and when it's not working. I know when it feels like that person. We don't know what what that person wants, so we're not driven by nothing. I know those things. You know, maybe I have to do more concise this time. Maybe I have to, oh, oh, okay, let me get the rhythm. Let me find the rhythm. Because I'm in service. So when I show up as shameless, whatever the case, I'm in service to this, like, crazy world we writing? Okay, I'm in service. All right, so he's drunk and she's like, what can I do? How can I offer? You know, I think when you do that, if you still stay in service of the work, you're going to find the way to find that ebb and flow. Because you're just going to go, oh, you need it fast. You need me to think of me. I'm learning from the people around me. They move up really fast. They're not being precious about this. They're thinking about something really fast and they're going with it. And so that's, you know, you, you sink or you swim, and you're going to find out real fast you swim. And there was another one. Hi, my name is David. Hey, David. I'm a, I'm a writer slash storyteller, and I've often been in situations where higher ups have always told me that my stories and my truth are too much, or it's, it can't be shown. And I have to like, tone it down. Like, how would you deal with that situation as someone who's not in a position to really be able to speak up? Um, I would. I okay. So I, one would say I would. I would re-examine what it means to not be in a position to speak up. I think you're always in a position, right? You may not be able to speak up um, in the ways that you. I don't know. There's more than one way to speak up. I'll say that. Um, and so for your work. So for your voice, there, I think that there is a difference between someone helping to, to offer constructive criticism about our work, right? When they're saying like, maybe you have a lot of ideas and I can't follow all these ideas, right? Then I have to go, what am I trying to communicate as a storyteller? So I will take all the information anybody, any great note giver will give me about whether or not what I'm trying to do is working. Is, is, is being communicated the way that I want it to be. That's the that's ebb and flow of like sharing your work, right? However, if what I know I want to communicate and you're saying don't communicate that, that's of no use to me and just ignore the shit out of it, right? Because that's of no use. To tell me not to speak my truth is of no use to me. That's of no use. If you're saying when I speak my truth, I, you don't understand what it is I'm actually trying to say, then now there's something to work with. Because I do want to communicate something, otherwise I wouldn't be sharing it in a public form. I'd just go scream into a pillow. It has its value. But, <laughs> but if I'm getting into a public space, I want to communicate something to that public. I need to know how they're thinking and listening, and that's just information for me to figure out how to communicate best. That's all, so I would distinguish maybe between what's useful, what's gonna help me tell my story. To tell me not to tell my story because my story can't be handled, then that story's not for you. We're done. And you're done. Because that's not of use to you as a storyteller, right? Yeah. And there's a, you, you all know the plays you know of Dominique, so there's a lot of plays before that. And there were plays people weren't ready for. There was a play set in an abortion clinic. There was a play people said, you're not allowed to tell this. Don't even talk about this play anymore. This happened. You know the ones that you know about, but there was a long line of plays where people were saying, no, you can't do this, and, and Dominique continued. Yeah, I do, and that doesn't mean somebody's gonna produce them, but who cares? I mean, that those, all those plays are helping me get to the, the plays you know. 
They're all helping me get to the next point. Right? Yeah. Uh, the middle, well, yeah. Hi, my name is Aurelia, and I'm an actor and director, and I just had a question for you in terms of working on uh, when your work is new in a room with the director. What what are ways that you like to communicate with directors, or do you have any stories about like, oh, that was helpful? Okay. In terms of being a playwright, communicating with the director. Mm -hmm. First of all, I talk to directors, me and my directors have to talk ahead of time. Um, and this is from my very first play. This is from me being like little writer coming to theater. Well, we're gonna produce your play, listen to everything we have to say. And me going, okay, so here's how I like to work. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because you gotta start early. Um, but I also am here to learn. And I'm here to learn from people that know more than me. So that's the other thing. I do want to say that because, I, you know, as, as bold as we can be in our voices, I do think we have to know how to listen. I'm a listening artist for sure. I don't know everything. And there are people that have walked this path before me, that have been in these rooms before me. And I, I listen, but I, I always listen with what is useful to, to what I'm trying to do. But for me with directors, I like to talk to directors ahead of time. Talk about what the process is, how I want to be used in the process. I like to speak my mind in the process, but I also will have to respect my director's authority in the room. Because if you undermine a director's authority in the room, the cast is like, Who, who's the leader? And it gets, it gets really uncomfortable and nobody trusts nobody, and the whole shit falls apart, right? So I do think that there is, I talk to the director, how do you want me, can I, I will always, before I speak in the room, say, director, do you mind, can I, can I add to that? Right, so I'm not gonna be silent, but I will turn to my director and go, is it okay if I jump in now? And they'll say, because they're most of the time always gonna say yes, but I am showing my cast, I will give them authority, you know? Um, because you have to be able to listen to them. But I will give context to that scene. I will never tell an actor how to do anything other than give them context for the line that they have or the story that they're telling, right? And that's the, that's the thing I've worked out with my director. But if a director doesn't want me to speak at all, I don't trust that director. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What do we have? Uh, Hi, yeah. let's, get to, let's get to the back. Let's go to the back then. Put your hand up high. Oh. <laughs> Hello, hi Dominique. Um, hi. Yeah, y'all go. Um, first, first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you for always being an advocate, especially for young playwrights like myself coming up always. Ever since, like, I reached out to this woman on Facebook and she can, and she give me back. Not saying just go to a, a full line, but <laughs> she, when she says that she's here for community, she truly is. So in the namesake of community, um, something that I, I've been noticing and um, in regards to like our institutions and our sort of black institutions and the idea of um, taking, of reprogramming um, the worth of our institutions. There is something that we've been programmed that whiteness that is the eliteness and what we should aspire and I find myself even dealing with it in which I have to reprogram myself because at the end of the day, who do I write for? I write for my people. That's just my perspective as a writer. So, do you see that there is some type of ruminating or something that's happening amongst the community, either in theater or in TV, where people are like, F it, let's just create our own spaces, let's create initiatives or programming in which we reprogram new up and coming art artists to know that, that, that there, is, there is sanctuary in these spaces, there is importance in these spaces, and to, and to just have your, to inspire, just have your work on certain stages, it's not the end all and be all of success. Um, so I'm wondering if something like that communication is happening. Absolutely, and it's happening in a macro way, like in a big, very commercial kind of way, and then it's happening in a micro way. Um, I do think that that is ongoing, and that's for every community, and I think it's for all communities, I wouldn't say marginalized communities, because it's not even people of color, I mean, it's anybody that finds themselves in the margins. I think they have what is their, what is their niche community work, you know, and then they have like this mainstream, this mainstream white, very, you know, particular older white audience kind of theater, you know? And, uh, and I think that has been an old question. Everybody's been trying to figure out. I think that we're looking at a lot of shit, but we're not there yet, um, about whether or not, I, I think there's two things. I mean, one thing that you're talking about is how we assign value, and that's on us. That's on us, right? Like, we just don't see value we, we don't feel good unless we got the, we don't feel good with the BET award, we want the Oscar. You know what I mean? We just don't feel good enough with it. I, for me, I feel fine, I, I mean, whatever. Award, no award, I feel good about the work. 
but I, but but I'm in a I'm in an industry that does pay attention to the the industry doesn't also pay attention to the BET award. No one cares about your NAACP award. It's nice on paper. No one no one cares, but people will give you more money with your Tony or with your you know Emmy maybe. I mean I know Oscar winners who are like girl no. You know, um, but that's another, that's another kind of another conversation. I think that it's about how we're assigning value to those institutions. I think it's about economics. That's a big thing. But I think more people will be excited to participate in any theater community, wherever they can get community, if they could make money doing it. But nobody can make money in any part of theater. <laughs> now mainstream white theater, I mean all theater is like questionable when it comes to money. Um, so I think in terms of longevity, Right, so that's just a that's just what we're fighting collectively. But then I think when you start getting to more more specific community institutions, then you have like resources become a bigger a question. There are some institutions that do have resources, but how that resources get how those resources get funneled, how they keep their doors open, who they have to bring into those spaces in order to keep their doors open is the whole thing, you know. And so I think we can invest. We have to help those institutions stay alive. I take my work to. I'm sort of the person that feels like I can work at the public and I can work at MBT. And actually, I'm on my same play that goes to the public to go to MBT. You know? And I did that in 2013 with my first play in New York City. But I can I also, and that's happened in several cities. I've, I've done that. My play was at Baltimore Center Stage, and then it's going to get that same production, going to take it to Detroit Public Theater, this very new theater in my city. Right? You know, but it's to, because I, we have to see the value in the, these big institutions don't last without these smaller institutions. They don't even make it without these smaller institutions. You kind of need everybody to be practicing their art. And if everybody's practicing their art, there is commerce. There will be money flowing for all those institutions, so we sort of have to kind of be in concert with each other and instead of everybody trying to grab <coughs> that last crumb and, and cut everybody else out. So I, you know, I think there is a way to do it. I just I think we're still finding it. Hi. Um, I'm Angela. I'm a BFA in acting major at Brooklyn College. Hey. Um, so I'm, I'm about to graduate soon. And I know that representation is a big thing when it comes to um, getting noticed in the industry or even breaking out. And so with all these immersive theater pieces coming on, not everyone has a chance to get an agent. What do you, what's your advice with going about that, navigating, like getting your foot into the door? Like, let's say I want to be in your play or in anyone's play, how do we do that without Without an agent. Yeah, like how could we be our own voice? I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not somebody that feels everybody has to jump in to get an agent. I think your hustle gets you much further than your agent will. So, I mean, that's just true. I, I, I have an agent, I've been with my agent for um, 10 years. I love my agent. I've gotten myself a lot of work that I have. You know, my agent gets me introductions. I get the work done. Right, and so, and I build the relationship. My agent follows up on relationships I start. So I go, hey, I, hu I hunted this person. I've been stalking him. Go get him. <laughs> go figure, go do some more stalking for me, you know? But I started those things. And, and honestly, I mean, especially when I first got my agent, my productions and all those things, that, that, that started from, I was in the Emerging Writers Group. I applied for that. My first production came out of me being at that theater, not my agent. My agent didn't give me any of my first productions, you know? Um, and so, I, as an actor, also, it's the same hustle. I mean, Ben and I started, this is like, that's what I'm trying to tell you, these old school years. <laughs> we started a theater company. You know, we, we were doing, we were writing shows for each other and our friends, you know? And but he had a festival, he had a theater festival I wrote a play for every year. We, there's more we can do, and he got very visible out of doing, Hip Hop Theater Festival was very big on putting a lot of us on. And that was a, that's a grassroots movement theater festival. And that, and we got, people got agents off of those things. I mean, Ben got not only an agent, but also like uh, vetted by HBO's Comedy uh, Arts Festival and Aspen. Like there's a lot of big things that happen out of doing, make the people come to you. You know, we've, uh, we've been starting culture and the Bronx started hip hop. Like, and, and now hip hop is mainstream. Like go to, the, go to the hood and start your shit there and let people come to you, they will. I guarantee they will. Got you. Thank you so much. Yeah. You wanna? Oh, okay. Hello, Dom. It's me, Dexter. Hey, Dexter. Um, people call me Dad sometimes, so you can call me Dad. <laughs> um, so I heard this quote, right? Brilliant quote. And I'm a 
to paraphrase it for you. So it goes like, my worth doesn't come from the other side of the table. I walk in with another. Mm -hmm. right. And so I got that from you. <laughs> so my question to you, though, is um, how do you stay humbled and focused in life and in the business as far as in terms of keeping your eye on the prize? Like, have you ever had a goal and got distracted by something that shouldn't have distracted you? But it always, that distractor always comes right when you need it not to. Oh, yeah. I mean, what's that like? The devil's business, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I thought, yes always and I don't know I mean how do you stay humble again I just I think it, I ha it always comes back it will always come back to service to me when you are in service you don't have time your ego don't have time it has no room at the table you know when you in service when you know that you are here for this story for this work for this art for this continuum for these people that this is why the story means a lot because those stories represent real people in the world Right, like while we sit up in here, like, oh my God, like, um, you know, do I like to wear this to the red carpet? Like somebody's out here in these streets, like being really affected by real shit, you know? And that's what these stories are about. So to me, that's always why that's so important. That's why I'm gonna serve that. Uh, and it might be, even if it's, even if it's Shakespeare, we're looking at, you know, King Lear. We, we're looking at power, right? So like, I'm in service to the story that is gonna have us thinking more about power and how, how power gets distributed, you know, in family or in monarchies or in whatever. So I just, I think it has to, when you can get the ego out of the way, and it is a lifelong practice, because it will always rear its ugly head and come on over here, <laughs> follow this over here, you see what they doing over there, count all these other people's blessings and then like, you know, and measure yourself against them, right? Like that's the bad stuff to do. And we always have to check ourselves when, because it will always come up, and we, so we always have to check ourselves and go, okay, not my point. My point is, I'm in service to these stories that I want to tell, or that I want to be, uh, I want to help tell. You know, um, and that's the way to slay that, that monster. That monster will come up every time. Yeah. Wanna come move through here? Hey, how you doing? My name's Makai. Hey, Makai. Um, I was wondering if you could walk us through your like writing process a bit. So you're like struck with inspiration, or you have a job like ain't too proud to do, and you you know have to do some research and something like that. So like how how do you start? You sit down, you're at the computer, and what happens? So I, and I'm, first of all, I'm not at the computer. <laughs> That's, I don't start there. That's a great question. And it's different for every project. But for instance, Ain't Too Proud. That's a little different, you guys. I just want to say that because Broadway's a different animal. This came with, with producers, commercial producers. They wanted this to go to Broadway four years ago. They came to me and hired me. It's a different thing. This is not like when I sit in a room and I have an idea and I want to tell. So I just want to be clear. If you want to know about Broadway, I'll tell you about that too. If that's what our interest is. But if we're talking about how we generate work ourselves, that's different, right? So I'm gonna keep the Broadway out of it for now um, because that's about being hired, you know? Um, and about being thinking, can I be in service of the thing that I'm being hired to do? To my personal process, or if I'm sitting in a room and I want to tell a story about three plays about Detroit, and you know, or I want to write about Pipeline, I want to write about the school to prison pipeline. The first thing I'm interested in, it's the stuff that keeps me up at night, right? I talk, I care about the world. Let's start there. <laughs> so I watch, when I watch things in the media, when I read news, when I watch documentaries, documentaries really inspire the hell out of me. I mean, I don't think anything actually moves the needle for me as an artist more than a documentary. Um, so I, I watch documentaries a lot. And these issues, like if they get under me and I'll talk about them and I can't sleep about them or whatever, that's when I know I want to write about them. But then I, that's a broad thing. Like, oh, I want to write about the school to prison pipeline. I was reading Michelle Alexander's book, Reading also inspires me. I'm reading Michelle Alexander's book and I'm like, damn, oh, the school to prison pipeline and oh, this is really bad and you know. And so then I go, how do I want to tell this story? Because I want to talk about this issue, but an issue isn't a play, it's an issue. I think when it becomes a play is when I can figure out who Whose skin is this issue gonna live on? Yeah. Uh, I wanna see a mother, I wanna see a mother, single mama. You know, I wanna see a son, but I wanna see a teacher, because people don't know what teachers go through. So I start thinking of the people. Before I sit down and write anything, I'm thinking about people and characters and who I want to tell these stories on. You know, when it comes to Skeleton Crew, I go, I know I wanna tell three plays about Detroit. I know, because I like the number three. I know I want to do 2008 because I know I, I, I want to deal with that. I was dealing with some things when I would go home and see houses boarded up on my block. Like, what's going on? 
you know? Um, and when my own relatives lost their jobs in the factory, I'm like, what's happening? Right, so I know I'm itched by that, but I have to think, so, okay, so how, if I wanna tell a story about like the foreclosure crisis and the factories closed, I'm like, who, who do I wanna tell that on? Okay, I know I wanna see a factory, because I haven't seen that. You know, so I start, I have to like think of the macro, and then I start counting down to the many, many, many micro. So I get to person, and what is it that they want? I don't really know what to write until I can think about who do I want to tell this on and what are they, what are they going to fight or die for? Right. And I, when I know what you're going to fight or die for, I got you. Right. All day. Because anything can happen from that. Right? You can fight or die over a piece of cake. Yeah. That, I can make that very interesting, as long as I know what that cake means to you. Right. You know what I mean? It's, it's not about, the, it doesn't have to be these great big things. It's just about what you, what you care about, what that character cares about enough, they're willing to, to go hard for it. And then I, and then I have something to, to write about. Um, so that's sort of my process. I start very big and then I get down to the small before I start writing. Yeah. Awesome. thank you. Hi, Dominique. Hi. My name is Rishma. So um, I'm a late bloomer. Um, I went to school and got my master's and worked a nine to five only to find out that that's not my passion. Yeah. My passion is writing, my passion is acting. And um, I did my first play production uh, Saturday, it was at a church. And it was very much received. <laughs> about it because I didn't realize that it was a it was such a gift so my question to you if you can take me back to when you first did your first production what was what was the steps what was all into it because I'm a fish out of water I'm, I'm trying to learn all this I feel like I'm tr trying to catch up now so if you can take me back to the first time you did your first production. I don't know if you did it at a school or... I did, and I can tell me it's a lot of steps, and I, we won't be able to go through all of them right now, but what I can tell you is my very first play, I mean, I did too many things, right? But that's okay. That It starts like that. I produced my own work for a while. You know, I produced my own play in Detroit. You know, um, but I did everything. I, I, like I said, I wrote it, I directed it, I, I starred in it, I choreographed it, I costume designed, I sound designed it. And say, hey, y'all run this for me, but I'm, I'm gonna lead it, you know? I'll never do all those things again. I'm maybe a schizophrenic, you know? But, um, but it, it, takes, it takes people to, I, I, I never, I used to do, direct my own plays without a stage manager, which is ludicrous at this point in my life, right? But that's like grassroots, that's what we did. So I'm, I'm gonna get the play up any, by any means necessary. I think that you, I would find, if nothing else, I would find somebody who's really skilled in stage management as a collaborator, or really, if you're writing, I'll find a really skilled director to just partner with you. And they can be, you know, new, fresh out of school. Don't go for the people that's already got a big old bunch of stuff on their plate, because they're not gonna be necessarily in service to you. Find the people that are just as hungry as you, right? Find the people, I won't say this to everybody, find the people that's just as hungry as you. There is nothing, I, I'm, I am an artist that gets calls from very, you know, celebrities and for the like. And I am not as excited by celebrities as I am by my peers. I, um, I don't want to be in service to a celebrity. I want to be in service to a storyteller. And a lot of times when you work with celebrities, you're working with a celebrity, not a storyteller. Yeah. You, know, you know, you're working with this person's per you know, this person is now blessing your work. And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> that's not how that works. <laughs> you know, um, we're, so I, I, I say that because I think that there's nothing that I don't need to get Spike Lee. I, I respect Spike Lee's work. I don't, but I don't need to go chasing him for my next opportunity at all. I, because that's, he, he already did what he did. He's already, he did his job. He inspired me. That's all he had to do. My job is to now use that inspiration and create for myself and my peers, you know? Um, and so I would say find you, the people around you that have studied the other complementary components of producing, but that you can put a team together for, and many teams. It's like a band, you're gonna go through many collaborations. Bands don't stay together, <laughs> you know, but just find you a bunch of people that are interested in putting up this thing in this one small, start small, this one weekend show, you know, that you can hone your skill in. That's what I would do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Oh gosh. Um, hi, I'm Jennifer with Developing Artists. Yes. Hi. Um, <laughs> um, so 
I consider myself a poet, and I think I've been wanting to transition into playwriting and into different mediums, and it's really scary. And I wanted to ask you how exactly you went about implementing your poetry and your other work into your playwriting, and how you went transitioning from one to the other. Slowly. I actually started reading more, um, and because Ben and I fought about poetry and plays forever, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, my plays would be started off with like all complete poetry plays, and so like a half of poetry, and then I would like, sprinkle in some like dialogue. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And then it would just like go from then mostly dialogue with moments of poetry. <laughs> you know, so I've gone through the whole thing, you know, and they're, and they're, they're all right. They're all right. They're all correct. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, because it's just exploring the voice. I think if you really like poetry in writing, if that's your entry point, you know, I would I would look outside the box. I would not look for linear writers, right? Like, I mean, it's a, and I would actually have people throw out if y'all know some poet writers that you're really into, you know. But again, I mean, it's like could coin Koya poem. So I would start with her, you know, and see how she did. She had and other pieces, you know, that Sonia Sanchez has written plays. Yeah. You know, I would look at like poets who are playwrights. Um, Amir Baraka, Baraka yeah. is a poet playwright. You know, I would look at those people and find how they, they started to use poetry in their language as well, you know, which is another trick to me. So you can find, I would look for examples in the writing and find who you love the best. Um, Jose Rivera is a very poetic writer. Yes. You know, so like, he, I mean, I feel like his plays are like poems. <laughs> You know, even though they are characters and there's action, so I would I would put those people on your list. Well, Ben, you wanna come down and get back to the front again? Right here. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, I'm Vinny. I'm an MFA student uh, at St. Francis. Hey, Vinny. And um, this question I love to ask every uh, speaker we have okay. is, how do you know when you're done? How do you know the project's complete? You can't edit it anymore, and it's ready to go. That's good. Uh, that's a great question. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I know how to explain that. You know, I feel like I always know when I'm done. I always know when it's, I'm done. I don't have nothing to say about that. You know, and it, I, I have a vision for the end. You know, like I don't know the word per se, but I know like all oh, they're gonna. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, do we grieve? You know, and then sometimes I know, and then she's gonna shoot them and we out. <laughs> but I don't know it until I'm doing it. You know, I don't always know that. So, I mean, I have a vision of like, I know what I'm getting toward. But when it happens, I don't, I'm surprised myself at the end. I go, when, when, when somebody shoots somebody and it's done, I'm like, oh. I think that's it. I think I'm done. <laughs> you know, I don't have nothing to say. <laughs> that's him. That's it, Dominique. That's all you got. You know, and so I, I think I just know what I'm doing when I have taken all of my, uh, it has, I have taken my own breath away. <laughs> I'm taking my own breath away. I'm like, I'm done. She cried. She danced. I'm out. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm down to the front, man. How we doing? We're good? I think we probably want to okay. Yeah. Just like a couple more. Yeah. And I'm Nate. Hey, hey. Hi. Um, I just, I like, this is a question I also like to ask um, the panels. Uh, would you mind describing a moment in your journey where you felt like it was like a big failure, a big mistake, and like what you learned from that, like, and how you move forward? Oh. Um. I mean, I could name a lot of failures that I don't know that I thought that they were failures after. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I could go back and tell you, like, ah, uh, I think my biggest failure, I don't actually look at my work as a failure. Um, I actually don't look at my work as a failure. That doesn't mean I think my, all my work hit it out the park. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, Afros are in. And I would go back and do that very differently. But I actually think that I had a one woman show, you know, but I actually think, like, don't talk about it. I had a one woman show. I just feel it's important. Ready to speak on it. It's important. Know? Dominique's yeah. a great writer, and she worked really hard to be a great writer. It'd actually be useful to see the shows. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had a one woman show that I was like, oh, poets, all, all these poets have their one woman shows. I'm actually an actor. I can write my own one woman show. And it wasn't actually that easy. And, um, and now I know so much more. I could do it. I could do it now. Now, I probably don't have any interest anymore in doing it. But I, I think what I've learned is just, just trial and error. 
of like, I'm gonna just throw myself into everything that I think I wanna do, right? So like, as a writer, I was like, oh, okay, so they got 10 minute plays, one acts, one person shows, full length plays, Gloria poems, straight, I'm gonna try it all. And I literally, I mean, I, I made a conscious decision, like, oh, I'm gonna try every kind of play they have. Cause I wanna get exposed and I wanna, you know. Um, I think the biggest, maybe a failures for me are more when I don't think I did something when I didn't stand in my bravery, you know? Like, or I didn't say the thing that I wanted. That's, that's the real failure to me artistically. My fails of successes, cause like, I tried and shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. I, you might not think I said what I needed to say, but I felt very fine about what I said in that moment. And I'm moving on. I'm gonna say it better next time probably, but I don't know that in the moment. And I don't, I don't, I think if I did, I wouldn't, I wouldn't move on. You know what I mean? I don't feel like, oh, that was a bad thing. I feel like, ah. Oh, Great, okay, so next time, <laughs> I have these other ideas, and I don't, I don't ever look at the one that I did before, it's like, oh, that wasn't a good idea. I just don't look at it like that. Uh, but I do feel, when I, when I feel like I truly have failed, and I'm really trying to think about it, which is like, oh, I can't think when I failed, which is a lie. I can think of work that needed to improve upon, but I, I think I don't have the, I don't sit in the feeling of failure, because I just, um, I think everything is important. I think everything I did, everything was a lesson, you know? Uh, I, only time I really do feel like I failed is, again, like I, I, when I've taken on work that I haven't felt right about, or I've, I've, I've allowed something to happen with my work that I haven't felt right about, but I've, oh, I've gotten myself out of it. I figured it out somewhere in the process, like, ooh, you don't want this project, get out. Yeah. So I quit, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't wanna tell this story anymore, I'm out. I know you're gonna burn a bridge. The bridge should, God, I've already set it on fire. <laughs> Not every bridge should be crossed again. You know, so, I mean, I, yeah, that's it. I, I, I don't really feel like I, I failed only when I haven't tried. So then that sense, I really just don't think I'm failing right now. Hey, Dominique, come here. Hey, come you mentioned when A2 Pride was happening, you talked to your spiritual counselor. Mm -hmm. What other things do you do to get yourself centered outside of the art to help aid you with the art? I keep good friends around me. I have gotten rid of the ones that are not good. Um, I have gotten rid of toxic people in my life. You know, that's, I really, that's a very important part of my whole artistic, holistic self. Uh, people that don't, um, that I feel are users or don't, don't see themselves as a service along with me, that don't see, um, that we don't see that we are part of a journey together, you know, that um, are on a singular journey, have not been useful to me. And, and who don't believe in the vision, who don't believe, if we, not, if we don't have the same somewhere in the world, some same framework, mm -hmm. they can't be in my close circle. Um, because they're gonna, they're not just, we just can't move together. But I have met a lot of people that are, and I, I ask them for reminders when I'm spiraling. You know, so I do, I mean, I do reach out to people. I reach out to mentors. I reached out to Lynn Nottage because I was like, oh, okay, now we on this other side of this. Tell me how you stay in this. Tell me how you stay in this, you know, because I'm getting exhausted by some things. And, you know, so I reach out to people and say, hey, not everybody's gonna have time in every moment, you know, and that's okay too. I will find who has the time in the moment and I'll go back to people. I circle back, I circle back. One of my biggest failures is, here's a failure. Sonia Sanchez came to my school one year and we met her, we were like, a, like much more personal than this. It was like five of us, you know? And she talked to us, she did poetry and then she talked to us, you know? And somewhere in that night she said, yeah, you know, and, and you guys, here's my information and come, you know, um, hang out at my house and we'll do a slumber party and stuff. And we were like, ha ha, a slumber party. But none of us took that shit serious. We did not think she was gonna have us come to her house and be in no slumber party, you know? But we liked the idea of it, you know? And so we did not follow up. And uh, now I have met Sister Sonia Sanchez repeatedly. I still have, you know, that, I, I still have a song part. Well, I have met her repeatedly, um, and every time I meet her, I have to reintroduce who I am. I lost that moment of connection. I lost that moment of whatever that could have been. You know, um, I have learned from that to hold, take people seriously when they say something. 
and uh, and reach out and reach out to find mentors. And that keeps me very grounded because we will all spiral. You know? Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I took that. <laughs> Hi, um, Auntie Dominic, I like to call you Auntie Dominic. I hold you so close to my heart. Because I'm telling you the truth. I go home, and there are moments where I'm writing, and I'm just like, oh God, this is so overwhelming right now. All these characters walking around in my head. I just want to scroll on Instagram. And then all of a sudden, I'm thinking, what would Dominic do? <laughs> I said, no, she would write this play and get back to work. Um, but I wanted to ask. I mean, Big Sister Dom could work. <laughs> She got about like 40 years on me. <laughs> that's cool, that's cool. Um, but I want to know, what happens when you have several stories walking around in your head at the same time? And you don't know, like, there are so many different things going on. It's like, well, I can tell this story. This is on my heart. This is on my mind. This happened to my cousin. But, you know, mm -hmm. what do you do? Yeah, I mean, I call it the cue. They're in the queue. Okay. Yeah. Put them in the queue. Right. You know, my husband sells me write stuff down because I forget stuff, but I go, but then I was supposed to. If you come back to me, then I'm supposed to write. You know. Uh, but or you can write it down. You can say, here's a list. I mean, sometimes I do brainstorms and I go, here's all the things that are on my mind to write about. And sometimes they'll find their, a couple of them will find their way to the same place. You know, just by different people having different issues, right? Um, but sometimes they won't, and so then I go back to the queue. I mean, I have like you know, uh, worker stories and, you know, and, and pipeline stories. I had that on the queue for a while, you know? I knew ahead of time when I wrote Detroit 67 that I wanted to write three plays, you know? But I was like, I'm gonna start with this one, you know, and see if I can get through the vision of, of writing it down. And sometimes I can ping pong between them, but not too many, because then I won't get through anything, you know? So I put it in the queue, because I can come back to that story. And it's just, if I'm still passionate about it a year or two after I've already written this one, then, it's, then I know it's the one. And sometimes it's gonna come and go, you know? And those little, or they make themselves little characters, little moments in other stories. There's a way to incorporate all that madness that's in my mind. This will be the last, uh, oh, what is it? No. no? <laughs> Sorry. Was, well, you promised the island promise back. back. Last two. Can last, last two, last two. Last two. Last two. Oh, Sorry. No. You know what, Dominique, um, Sister Dominique, um, <laughs> Can, uh, can we get all three? Yeah. And then see how you coordinate it? Yeah, we'll right. go question, 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 and then answer. Let's see what happens. Let's, see. let's hear them out. Hi, Mary Gray. Um, I am, I've been auditioning for about four years now for MFA programs, and I keep it involved. And it's um, just super frustrating, but I feel this urge in me to, to write, because I have always viewed myself as a storyteller, and I feel like the stories want to come out but I'm not necessarily sure how to approach it. So just any advice you have on on, a, on an actor's, because you study acting, an actor's developing their voice as a storyteller. As a writer. Okay, got cool. it. Actor developing voice as writer. This stems to the same question. Right. How do you nourish and uh, feed both of those? Um, actor writer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you nourish and stem an actor writer yeah. and find your voice as a And the last one. <laughs> Thank you. For I Sorry, I'm making quick words to wrap. Um, I just wanted to say I'm um, thankful for you for paying it forward by bringing so many people here together today to actually give insight because the artist in me knows what it feels like to go through this. So I just wanted to say thank you. For it. So many people here, y'all can connect with each other and possibly create the future that she speaks about and create that whole thing that y'all would want to do. Thank you. There you go. So There you go. Oh, well, okay. So that's that. After the writer. After the writer, and how do you nourish them both? Right. Oh. Yes. Okay. Here's the thing: as an actor developing your voice as a writer, I think the good writers read writers. Read, read, write, read plays. Read the kind of writing you think you might want to be doing. If you want to do a solo show, read some great solo writers and watch their solo shows. Danny Hack and John Leguizamo are two really amazing ones, and Sarah Jones, right? Like those are people that people oh, really love. Me. Yeah, right. Up. We're say, oh, no, not just son. And you know, so anyway, so those are some amazing ones, right? But I think that's one thing is to if you if you are called to to write, you just gotta try it out. You gotta just start. 
you know, <laughs> and find who you want to who you want to tell the story on. If it's just yourself, if it's the people from your neighborhood that you just Ruben Santiago Hudson's right now doing Lackawanna Blues in LA. That's what got him on like a bigger Tony Award winning map, right? I mean, also doing August Wilson all these years. Um, but I think that Lackawanna changed the trajectory of Ruben's career because he, he he lived in a boarding house with his grandmother and remembered all those characters that he met in her life and put them all in a show. Right, so there's a lot of ways to, you are, you are an actor, then you understand character. So if you're not trying to necessarily write, you don't have to necessarily write a linear play, right? You can write stories from the blah, 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 right? That are just collections from people. So I would also read short stories, because short, like uh, J. California Cooper, because they write in first person, or they write in this very like narrative way. Um, you know, uh, in documentary, because that's people telling their own story from their own mouth. I just think those are ways to get like story from a non-traditional standpoint, right? So to nourish the actor and the writer, hey, that's different for different people. Um, I think that, you know, I have some friends who want to be in their work. I don't always want to be in my work. I did not, I don't have that itch. You know, sometimes, sometimes I do. I, I write characters that I would want to play, but then I'm okay with somebody else playing them. Because I really want to write the play really well. And to do that, I want to see it, I want to listen, and, and, and sit outside of it, and not have scatterbrain on it, right? But if I feel nourished as a, if I feel like I'm not as nourished as one, then I jump to the other. Because you can do it any time, right? I can write for myself, I can, I have friends that write, so I'm going to write my play, but then can I, do you need somebody to read your play? Call me to read your play. My friends are Katori. My friends are Ben, these are writers who played out now. Ben's play got me my equity card, you know? And so, yeah, just fill it in, actually, you know, for another. You did better, you did better. Then. Yeah, sure, okay, well, you did, don't say that. Maybe. Um, but, you know, and so I think that there's, there's a lot of ways to nourish both, if you need to, but I also believe very strongly, and this might be different than a lot of writer actors, I think you gotta move toward what moves towards you. So you do it all, you don't ever have to give any of them up. I'm, I am very visible as a writer, not an actor. I can be in anything I want whenever I want to now. I went and filled in for an actor on my own show last year, you know? So I can all, if I want to feed the acting muscles, I can do it, but I'm just moving toward what moves toward me creatively, right? And so if acting is moving towards you, you know you can follow it and see where it goes. If writing moves towards you, then follow that. But just be cognizant while you're nourishing both that something might be calling you something might be responding to you more, and you can, you can go toward it. And don't be afraid of leaving the other one behind. You always carry it with you as an arm. It's not going nowhere. You know? Yeah. Give it up for Sister Dr. Yeah.